with our own Bishop Robert T. Douglas. Yes, um, he's going to be talking about leadership today, leadership today. Um, like he needs an introduction, he doesn't because we all know this incredible, incredible leader, but we'll keep it official and read his bio as well. Bishop Robert T. Douglas Sr., PhD. He has been actively involved in the ministry of proclaiming and faithfully spreading the living word of God for more than four decades. The founder, CEO, pastor of Jacob's Ladder Church, excuse me, Jacob's Ladder Community Fellowship Church and ministry since 1986. He's also been the executive director and founder of the Jacob's Ladder Institute of Recovery. He is renowned internationally as an anointed teacher, preacher, and evangelist. His deliverance and prophetic Bible-based counseling ministry has been a blessing to thousands, seeking salvation, healing, and deliverance from alcohol and drugs. He has attended Enon Bible College, West Coast, the Ministerial Training Institute, Provident Theological Seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary, Zoe Christian Leadership Training Institute, Antioch University, and UCLA Counseling Certification Program. In addition to having a master's in Christian education, a doctorate in biblical counseling, and a doctorate in theology, he also holds credentials and professional certification in the capacity of doctoral addic addictions counselor with the National Board of Addiction Examiners. He is a bishop with the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Incorporated and currently serves as diocesan over what? The Central California District Council, which is the 66th Episcopal District of the PAW. He is approaching the 30th anniversary with the love of his life, Madam Bishop, Dr. Paulette Douglas, who was one of our dynamic speakers yesterday. Go back and check out her video on youtube.com central cdc number one today he'll be speaking with us about leadership today if you have questions type them in the chat or go on facebook live they'll be shared with him and if he has time to answer he will we will answer them otherwise they'll be posted on to centralcdc.org at a later time after the conference and so without further ado we're going to bring on the one and the only bishop robert t douglas Bishop, you there? Amen. Hey, let Amen. me go ahead and hey, let's spotlight you. Praise the Lord. Hey. Praise the Lord. Hey. Amen. Woo. Well, bless the Lord at all times that his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Once again, I want to say praise the Lord Jesus Christ Almighty for his goodness and for his mercy, for the ever-loving kindness that he has bestowed upon us. I want to just give accolades and honor to our own um, uh, Suffragan Bishop David Aaron Rohn, our illustrious chairman, our sister Suffragan Bishop Jeffrey Richardson Jr., and our chairman of our uh, uh, Budget and Finance Committee, uh, Suffolk Bishop Rawls, and to Suffolk Bishop Porter, Suffolk Bishop Vanessa De uh, Ussery, and Suffolk Bishop Douglas for their support in making us, amen, a great administrative team for this project. I also want to thank, amen, uh, Suffolk Bishop Stephen Hamilton, and I want to thank, amen, um, Pastor, Youth Pastor Tracy, and we not say Youth Pastor because it, it puts her in a different financial uh, uh, category for, uh, in terms of giving <laughs> and assessment. If you just say uh, Pastor Tracy, they think that she is pastor in the congregation, and so they will ask. <laughs> they will ask for what they asked us for. Amen. But we know she is our tech our TI person, and we're so grateful for her. I'm grateful for uh, Dr. Shekinah Douglas. Amen. Who is also uh, on the team. And uh, she and Tracy and Hamilton and uh, Bishop Brown have all concerted together and uh, uh, decided that they were going to do the best they can so that I can move on, amen, in terms of dealing with the pivoting uh, paradigm shifts that are coming as a result of uh, where we are today in ministry. 
Uh, I want to share some things with you. And I want to let you know that, uh, oh yeah, let me correct it. Uh, 32 years of marriage to the Honorable, amen, Southern Bishop, Dr. Paulette Douglas, amen, the, uh, uh, my life inside of Christ, amen, the engine to this Douglas family. Thank God for her, for her presentation. I think that Bishop uh, uh, Hamilton did an excellent job. And, uh, but I think uh, Pastor Tracy, youth Pastor Tracy didn't ha have outdone all of us because of the fact that she had really, really, uh, she's single, amen. That's not a pitch out there for none of you single guys because I've never seen her campaigning. But she's not married and she poured her life off into Christ, home assembly, this council, and then she looks at herself. I wish you all would read a book entitled Leaders Eat Last, Leaders Eat Last. And what I'm going to do, I'll be sharing some of the principles from that book, extrapolating from that book Okay, certain leadership things uh, as it relates to leadership for today. Before we pray and read our scripture, I also want to just let you know that I am so grateful for the staff that I have, amen, working with me and working, amen, uh, uh, for me, for us to uh, give us the best we have in terms of how we can uh, continually, amen, be productive in God's kingdom. I want to thank all of you, all of you. No matter who you are, I want to thank all of you for your divine support and to the leadership, amen. I've been given permission by God to do, amen, what he called me to do and that was to select the team members that I felt that would be, amen, best for such a time as this. Now, some people I didn't ask, uh, my method was and I would bring someone before the Lord in prayer. He would say, good choice, good choice, son, very favorable. And then some, God wouldn't say nothing, but I went on and did the best I could, thinking that I could help this person, amen, maximize uh, what uh, Abraham Maslow would say on uh, his hierarchy of needs, uh, structure dynamic, uh, of dynamics of uh, how to reach our maximum potential and self-actualization. And, uh, 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 but to help them fulfill Romans 11, 29 in their life, for the gifts and the callings of God come without repentance. And so I did the best I could with what I had, and then whatever is in you, amen, or whatever you are in life, your mind drops you off there, and whatever in you is going to come out of you. So if a person does not have the passion and the desire to breed, feed, and lead the apostolic way, the monotheistic one Lord way, well, that will come out too. And so I want to say one more thing before I pray and do the presentation. Uh, 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 you know, um, I, uh, I find it kind of challenging to whereas a lot of people, my style is different, but I do have uh, a gift that's not in the Bible. Well, it's in the Bible, but uh, the gift is this. I, uh, I never underestimate no man, no woman, no person. I never ever, and I've, that's been a principle of mine all my life, it just came with me innately. But my, I am who I am, okay? And I don't have a soft personality. Because of I came out of the streets, I came out of a broken home, I came out of the nation of Islam, amen. But I'm saved now, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. So when uh, people sometimes misinterpret that I'm not an encouraging person, and I'm probably not. I'm, pr I'm probably not to them, but I'm not a soft person to the extent I will always bring a challenge to you, and I will always be expected for you to give me a challenge back, and that's going to keep our relationship, amen, solid and tight according to Scripture. The Bible says in the book of Amos chapter number three, or verse number three, it can two walk together except they be agreed, and after the word agree at the end of that word, is a question mark. So I, I don't mean any offense to anybody. I just, I am who I am. I don't underestimate you. I don't hate on you or whatever it is, but I do have a goal and I do have a vision and God has allowed for me to make decisions as far as this council is concerned. Amen. I want to give thanks and honor unto God for my pastor, the Honorable Bishop, the former presiding Bishop, Charles Hayward Ellis III, and my first lady, amen, Lady Chrisette Ellis, and uh, many know, or some know, how uh, Bishop Ellis, after Bishop Johnson died, and Bishop Darcy died, amen, Bishop Stewart died, uh, went on from labor to reward, how Bishop Ellis, amen, became my pastor as I asked God. 
And so I want to thank God for them. I also want to honor, amen, our own presiding prelate, amen, the Honorable Bishop Theodore Brooks and First Lady Jan Brooks, who are the spiritual mothers and the fathers of this um, a, a great organization known as the Bishop Pentecostal Assembly of the World. And I'm glad to be a part of this great organization. Praise the Lord. And I want to thank God for their leadership and to my brother, Board of Bishops, amen, and to all of you that are online. Let us look to the Lord, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, uh, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever in Jesus' name. Great eternal Father, I come before your glorious throne of grace. I bow down at your mercy seat asking you to take me out of self, replace me with thy word, anoint and influence me with thy spirit, so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Say to the Lord, rebuke you. You have no power, no influence, no authority to come in and either interrupt, disrupt, or corrupt the message that is going to be delivered through these lips of clay in humility from the Lord Jesus Christ and influence into the precious faith of the soul that the God of glory gave his life for. The blood of Jesus is against you, Jay Satan, and we command you out of our environments and atmosphere, even right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I'm supposed to be uh, presenting on um, what is known as uh, leadership for today. Amen. And uh, this is a very, very, uh, uh, a very, very uh, sensitive topics. So I'm going to share the meat of it with you uh, at the beginning. And then the slides, amen, uh, my PowerPoint slides. Uh, however, our facilitator and coordinator, uh, Youth Pastor Tracy Willis, amen, will present them to you. Amen. Uh, make them available. Amen. I'm all for that. I also want to thank God, all right, for uh, the Jacob's Ladder family. You have been such a blessing. You have been such a shamarabo city. You have been so supportive. I wouldn't want any other church. Amen. I wouldn't want any other church to pastor, and I mean it from my heart. Amen. But you all. Now, I was trying to do my own PowerPoint. And that lets you know that uh, folk need help. It's starting with the bishop. <laughs> Amen. But Tracy has been trying to doctor it up and give me some uh, <laughs> give me some help in terms of making it presentable online. But nevertheless, I will keep going. Amen. I will keep going and allow for God. Amen. To use us to the best of his ability. All right. And we want to thank God, amen, for that. Now, today, if you look at the top there, that many leaders are struggling with the swift changes that have continued to occur, amen, in the face of the pandemic and the cries for justice. And this session will address how to be a strong leader today, all right? This will address how to be a strong leader today. And uh, in order to be a strong leader, amen, you're going to have to acquire strength. And the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is our strength in the book of Nehemiah. But also in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 12, verse number 3, the Bible says, for with joy, with strength, shall ye draw waters out of the well of salvation. Next slide, please. And so I want you to be able to look at the introduction where the Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter number 12, 32, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel, Israel, amen, a type, amen, of the New Testament church, and the New Testament church is a type of spiritual Israel, but to know what they ought to do. The head of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. And that's what we need today. We need, amen, brethren in leadership and sisters, or we just need personnel uh, that are going to be subjected, amen, to one another in the way that the Lord, amen, wants us to be. Again, I want to say, as I, I want to reiterate the fact that I was teaching the other day uh, from the book of uh, Acts chapter number 10, verse number 44 through uh, 48, when Peter was uh, dispatched on a soul patrol, 
and sent to the house of Cornelius, amen. And Cornelius uh, explained to Peter that he was a man under authority, all right? He was a man under authority, not in authority. He was a man under authority. In other words, okay, he was uh, uh, in charge, but he was not in control. Why? Because he was over a hundred men, all right? He was over, amen, a hundred men. And uh, uh, then you had uh, uh, leaders above him who were over legions, the quadrants, amen, of soldiers. And then you had uh, uh, men over him, amen, generals who were over entire regional platoons. And then you had, amen, the Senate of Rome. Then you had, they had their own joint chiefs of staff. Then you had Caesar himself, amen. So he was under somebody, amen. And that's the problem it's been today in most of our uh, religious organizations and our local fellowship is that people want to be in control, amen. And they want to be in authority, but they don't want to be under the authority. And that's not how leadership today is going, all right? Just like in the book of uh, Jeremiah, chapter number three, verse number 15, where the Bible says, amen, and I will give you pastors, not disasters, according to mine heart, who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And so that means that if God, amen, is the one that appoints you over a congregation, then you will have to be under somebody. All right. And that needs to be, amen, emphasized more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. All right. Now, the purpose of this 45 minute presentation is for the edification. Highlight that. Edification of we the kingdom servants. Remember, kingdom servant as a mentality and as a way of life to describe and operate in your craft and see your calling, amen, as a craft. When you see your calling as a craft, your skills, your talents, your resources, and whatever it is that God has empowered you to lead with, amen, it comes to bear. And we are kingdom servants. And we take on this, con uh, this concept, we understand that we're kingdom servants of our great creator and true savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by our own personal volition, volition is just about, is voluntarily. We have voluntarily committed ourselves to building his kingdom for the house, for this purpose of this presentation. I will be focusing primarily upon the responsibilities of biblically based Christ-centered leadership dynamics. All right? Thank you, Lord. Focusing primarily upon responsibilities and biblically based principles of Christ-centered leadership dynamics. And uh, that's when we are able to go into the Bible and extrapolate certain principles from Old and New Testament by virtue of the fact <coughs> that Jesus said, excuse me, in John 5, 39, he says, search the scriptures for in them you think ye have eternal life. He said, but they are they that testify of me. So the Old Testament is Jesus contained. The New Testament is Jesus explained. The Old Testament is the illustrated Jesus, but the New Testament is the demonstrated Jesus. The Old Testament represents in types, amen, but the New Testament represents in anti-types. And the anti-type is always stronger than the type because the anti-type is always, amen, a fulfillment of what the type was. So when we go into the scripture, amen, we are to look for Jesus and then we can extrapolate, all right, Christ-centered leadership dynamics our activities, our strategies in order to do what God had called us to do. I uh, hope that makes sense to some. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. All right, while we're waiting on the next slide, therefore it is both beneficial for each of our participants. I want you to get a pen and write, all right, to record because uh, what you write is the fingerprint of your cognition. Cognition means your intelligence. What you write, okay, you cannot blame it on somebody else, amen. It came from your mind, all right, and from your ink. And that's what David was doing when he spoke in the song. The Lord is indicting my heart, my mind, my cognition as a good matter. I'm going to write on the thing that pertained to the king. So the thoughts of God became David's ink. And David's faith and belief in God's word became the pen of what he write. He said, my tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. In other words, what I think and what I receive from God 
what I've written down in the song, the stanzas and lyrics to give to the chief musician to put the uh, heavenly melodial uh, 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 music to it. This all came from God. And so I want you to take relevant notes from the contents of this information uh, and to be studied and applied and added to your spiritual chemistry of your pastoral assigned ministry or your leadership ministry, especially as a result of the major complex and difficult life altering major events that exist uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. And a lot of people, I, I noticed when I was in high school and in, um, uh, I mean, middle school on up and through uh, college and even post-secondary educational environment, that a lot of people did not enjoy or did not benefit as much from the classes uh, before we had the cell phones and before we had the, uh, uh, how can I put it, uh, the iPads and the computers and the laptops. Uh, we had notes and people did not take writing notes down serious and they would never go back, amen, and study the notes and they didn't do that good on their exams or when they were proctored to be challenged to reveal or produce what they received as a result of attending the class for that particular period of time. They did bad or lower than uh, expected because of the fact they did not take notes. Take notes. Whenever you go to a service, whenever you go anywhere, especially if you're paying your money or giving an offering, take notes because there's no accidents in God, all right? There's no accidents in God. There's no accident that God allowed for us to be here today on this social media broadcast teaching about leadership today. Amen. He knew before the foundation of the world who would be here, who would not be here, who would invest, amen, their spirit, their faith, all right, their cognition, their intelligence, their mind, who would open up their heart like a sponge, all right, and receive the engrafted, unadulterated word of God, who would also participate in being financially supportive of what we are actually doing in this pivoting, amen, shift that we're in. God already knew it, so let's make the best of this here. All right, next slide, please. All right, now, coupled with the national protests and the unrest, all right, coupled with the national protests and the unrest as we as a society are experiencing momentarily, and this requires for the best leadership personnel available to be able to pursue a trajectory. A trajectory just means a, pay, a route or a course of action that you're going to take. And as leaders, you, mean you don't have to be a pastor to pursue a trajectory that is going to result in favorable resolve by way of knowing what the church, which is spiritual eyes, Israel in typology ought to do. All right. That is self-explanatory. Next slide, please. All right, now, what I want to do is deal with three, amen, synopsized or condensed uh, 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 methodologies and subject matters that will help you, uh, how can I put it, uh, benefit from this presentation more than anything else. First of all, I like to use down-to-earth rules, tools, and methods. That's what I like to do is use down-to-earth rules, tools, and methods, and I think that I may have, I may not have brought one of my old uh, seminary books up here by uh, Dr. Keller. But anyway, uh, I'll put that up at some other time. I'll do a part two. Uh, when you look at down-to-earth rules, tools, and methods, all right, look at this and take it very seriously. It's the responsibility of every leader to possess a winning strategy to lead his or her team to victory and crafting their winning strategy to prevail during crisis situations. And the reason why we do this is because it's biblically based and Christ-centered. In order for it to be down to earth, rules, tools, and method, it has to be biblically based and Christ-centered, all right? The Bible says in the book of St. John, chapter number 15, verses number five, in the latter clause of the text, of the V clause of the text, for without me, ye can do nothing. But it comes to us using down-to-earth rules, tools, and methods and embracing and not erasing the responsibility to, of each of us as leaders to possess a winning strategy to lead his or her team to victory by crafting, amen, your winning strategy to prevail during crisis situations. Well, if you look at Romans chapter number four, verse number 14 in the B clause of the latter part of the 17th verse of Romans chapter four, 
The Bible says, even Abraham, who believed God, who called those things that be not as though they already were. As leaders, amen, especially of the day, is some things you've got to exercise your faith, faith and call things that be not as though they already were. Anything that the mind can conceive and believe, it can also achieve, but you've got to be willing to put it to work. Your life, your mind is like an engine, amen. If you don't service it, amen, if you don't utilize it, then it'll freeze up on you. And when it comes to getting winning strategies, just like we're dealing with this crisis situation of the COVID-19 and the paradigm shift that we have to make in terms of how we uh, worship the Father in spirit and truth and how we serve his people and how we lead and breed his people, we're going to have to look at it, amen, in a more favorable context. And that's why you see the scripture up there, amen, Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the call according to his purpose. So it never said that it was going to feel good. Amen. You just can't hit stuff with a soft, hallelujah. You can't mother the church right now. Amen. You can't mother the church right now. The church, Jerusalem, listen, Jerusalem from above, which is us, the church, the bride of Christ, we are the mother of uh, them all. Amen. So you can't mother yourself right now. I mean, we have to stand up and deal with the things that God wants us to make work together for the good because we love God and because we are called according to his purpose. All right. So look at that for example. You've got to have a winning strategy. Without a strategy, amen, you're not going to be victorious and you're not going to prevail in crisis situation because of the fact you just can't wing it these days. All right. Next slide, please. All right, you got to be true Christ in a leader, and you must never seek for an opportunity to do your own thing according to the word of the Lord as recorded in St. John 15, 16, where Jesus told his disciples, you have not chosen me. That let us know right then and there. It's not about us doing our own thing, but I have chosen you, and I've ordained you, commissioned you, positioned you, empowered you, situated you, Amen. Anointed you, appointed you, that you go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, it shall be given you. Let's make sure that we don't allow our flesh to influence us to seek an opportunity to shine or to do our own thing. It's all about Jesus. We say that, and I know it sounds easy, amen, to say, but it is much more harder to do. It's just like marriage. I tell people all the time, uh, love is blind, but marriage is the eye opener. We fall in love with each other's personality, but we have to deal with the character within that personality. Amen. And to the Lord takes us on back to glory. All right. And so when you see two people going to separate corners or divorce court or whatever, it's that somebody tried to change somebody. I don't care if the other person was guilty. I don't care if there was a moral indiscretion. I don't care if it was something in terms of, uh, how can I put it, cross biological challenges and uh, uh, opposition, amen. Somebody felt as though somebody didn't deal with it right or wasn't gonna deal with it right or couldn't deal with it right, or, amen, this, that, and the other. And you're trying to change that person. That person may not have the skills. They may not have the values. They may have not have the cognition or the intelligence amen, to act around your family or around your friends or whoever like you want to. And when you can't change them, all right, then you find out when that is very difficult for you to live with them. So you say the best thing to do, we're going to part our ways. Well, God does not want us that to want that to happen with us when we're dealing with him. As long as we allow for him to increase in our flesh and our personality, decrease in the service of our king, we don't have to worry about, amen, uh, God, uh, punishing us or correcting us for doing our own thing, all right? So today's leadership, we need people who are willing to surrender themselves and not try to do their own thing. My vision, this, that, and the other, so forth and so on. My church, my people, my this, amen. No, no, no. We are, when we repented of our sins and we were baptized by, in water through immersion, 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and filled and sealed and we were designated to be ultimately thrilled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking another tongue as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, amen. We became word taught, blood bought, spirit called children, amen. Royal children adopted into a royal family and we are kept and preserved, amen, by the power of God, which is the retention apparatus that hold all of us, amen, to the kingdom of God. So God wants us to recognize, realize, and understand self needs to get out of the way for today's leadership. Because as the scripture says, when the Galatians came over, amen, to uh, 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 seek out Jesus, they said, uh, sirs, we would see Jesus. We don't want to see nobody else but Jesus. He is the true, only, wise, and living God. And he's still alive. Amen. And he's living inside of us. All right. Next slide, please. All right, now, let's see. Authentic God-ordained leadership is mandated, all right, to embrace and never erase the synergistic principle of collaborative altruistic participation. And let me say that again, and let me break some things down, and I would like for you to go with me into the second chapter of the book of Acts, all right, because we like the theological empirical data to be provided when we give any type of illumination or a revelation that's already in the Bible. If you go to the book of Acts, chapter number two, uh, chapter number two, let's just look at, for the sake of uh, time, let's look at, let's look at chapter number two, verses number 42 to 47. Now, remember, when you're talking about authenticity, you're talking about being real, all right? Our gain is being empowered and commissioned. We know what leadership is. Mandated means that it's essential. When something is mandated or something is essential, it's non-negotiable, all right? Embrace means to take it in without any opposition, all right? Never erase the synergistic, the synergistic principle. I learned that from the Honorable Bishop, amen, uh, 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 David Foster. Amen. So it was some 30 years ago about how to make, when he was an employee for the state of California, how they would make in his department as supervisor, the synergy, amen, principles work for the entire team on a collaborative basis, but it called for altruistic type of mentality. Synergistic means, amen, the sum total, sum total of the whole. Sum total of the whole is synergy. So the principle of collaborative means bringing together, involving more than one person. Altruistic comes from altruism, all right? An altruist is a person who says, never mind me, how's the next guy doing? A narcissist is a person that loves him or herself. They have the mentality of get all you can, can all you get, sit on your can, and keep the rest of the group away on the team if you can. That's not going to be the type of participation that we need to manifest in our leadership behaviors in today's leadership. And I'll get to some of the other things that you'll understand why. All right? Now, in reference to this and where I extrapolated this concept from was in the book of Acts chapter number 2, uh, verses number 42, through 47, the Bible says, and they continually, after they submitted themselves to baptism and the New Testament plan of salvation, or the new birth experience. The new birth experience was repentance from a sinful life, being immersed again, submitted, submerged in water, and submitting ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ's power and his dictates, is being baptized in the name of Jesus and being filled with the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, right? That was what Peter reciprocated or responded back to the people that asked him who are in the environment, who they were in the who were in attendance to the sermon he preached in verse 36. They said, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them, repent, verse 38, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They said, well, I know that, but then how does that work with the synergistic principle and a collaborative altruism, uh, altruistic type of mentalities when we're participating and working in a project and we as leaders are required to make sure the job gets done and gets done the way the Bible said. Well, in Acts chapter number two, verse number 42, the Bible says they continue steadfastly. In other words, they didn't stop. They just kept operating in this vein on this principle of the trajectory. 
the apostles' doctrine, all right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, above all, through all, and in you all, all right? Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of the name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So this apostle's doctrine, this one Lord, one faith, Jesus name, authenticity of monotheism. Monotheism just means the belief in one God. Mono means one, theism, amen, uh, is dealing with God. That's where we get the word theology from. There's a doctrine and fellowship. That's the social, all right? Our social fellowship right now is gonna be on social media because of the, uh, the uh, 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 COVID-19 pandemic that existed. And then fellowship, comma, what they did was, in sociality, they broke bread, all right, and they prayed together. The Bible said, and fear, fear in that context of scripture, the Greek would render it, render it, they reverence and they honored, amen, God so much that that reverence and honor and respect came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostle. And all that believed were together, synergy, it had all things common, not in common, all things common. When you put in it, it's going to start dealing with individuality. Some people call that communism or commune type of way or cult type of way. Well, people will say anything. Some people will argue with a stop sign. I'm not the person that will argue with a stop sign or subpoena a traffic signal to court. That just doesn't make any sense to me. All that believed were together. They were together. That's synergy. That's collaborativeness. And all things, they had all things, or possessed all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. They assessed what the person's need was before they tried to bring anything into their possession. And they continued daily with one accord, collaborative, synergistic operation in the temple, the church facility and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart it says nothing about COVID-19 praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved and that's how God is going to do it amen in the social media context we'll be able and I was listening to Sister Tracy a uh, Pastor Tracy I'm talking about how to respond to people's email and respond to their uh, uh, appeal, amen, to get to know us and to engage with us, amen, and give us a type of feedback on terms of what their uh, uh, spiritual needs may be and just for us to develop friendships and stuff and not just let people be hanging out there. Well, we're going to have to take this pivoting paradigm shift and go that way with dealing with people for salvation, amen, and is it like one soul at a time, one family at a time, one household at a time. If you notice something here now, please don't take this the wrong way. For uh, since 2001, 2001, Apostle Alexander and myself was trying to find out ways to get people, amen, he was trying to assist me with wisdom to become more participatory uh, in our uh, uh, councils of, uh, in our councils, uh, uh, but Henry had already started, Bishop Alexander had already started his organization, but I used to go to him for advice and for, uh, 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 how can I put it, some superior knowledge on how to do certain things. And if you notice, amen, we was down so much in terms of our attendance and people used all kinds of excuses of why they could not come and uh, be a part of these sessions that we're giving on a day-to-day -day basis during the Two, the three days that we have are two and a half days down that we have reduced it down to that for our council. And you'll see that all kind of reasons and all kind of excuses being given. This one had parenting problems. This one had uh, employment challenges. This one had traveling challenges. This one had physical or medicinal uh, 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 challenges. And then some people just didn't want to come. Well, now God has allowed for us to synergistically, amen, and collaboratively amen, participate in these classes based upon God adding to the church daily, meaning now that both of us who are computer savvy or have some type of uh, contemporary techn technological uh, uh, device where we can communicate with each other, be it iPhone or the computer or the internet or whatever, we have no excuse now. So God has a way, amen, of making all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them who he called according to his person, using the framework of what was outlined 
on the foundational uh, 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 concepts of the New Testament fellowship. Remember, our doctrine is built upon the foundations of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone of the living perpendicular that connects everything together to form any type of angle to come in to the square of light. All right, next, uh, uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, now we've got to go back to the other one. Did I say command, is that the next slide? Okay, command your mentality to consistently operate in a servant mode at all times, void of any excuses or uninvited opinions of others. And you'll see that if you go to Matthew 10 and uh, 24 and 25, let's go there right quick so that people know that we are Bible oriented uh, uh, diocese. In Matthew chapter number 10, and if you look at verse number 24 and 25, the Bible said, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. All right? It is not enough for the disciple that he be, I mean, it is enough for the disciple, thank you, to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? So if they talked about Jesus, they're going to talk about us. And especially as a leader, you cannot walk around taking the truth and the power and influence in these two contexts of scripture. You cannot walk around with your feet in the palm of your hand because people are going to talk about you no matter what. They talked about Jesus. They lied on Jesus. Amen. They discredited Jesus, but they never stopped him. Amen. From having the type of mentality that he was going to consistently operate in a servant mode at all times, all right? And this is what we need to do. Some people, amen, they will just come challenge you if they know that you're weak in your mentality and that you can be distracted easily and pulled here and pulled there, especially by an opinion or some type of negative type of talk. Well, they know, probably have studied you and know that you have a poor self-image of yourself. And so that's how they can hit you so much. But in today's leadership, you're going to have to operate from a position of strength you're going to have to see yourself as a servant, be in that mode at all times, and also as a soldier. And as a soldier, Paul told his young spiritual son Timothy in the gospel, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier in Christ Jesus. In other words, don't entangle yourself with the cares of this world or other people's opinion. You stay with what God told you to do and let God be God inside of your life, inside of your mentality, inside of your heart, and inside of your service and your kingdom assignment. Next slide, please. All right, you got to live and model the sacrificial, okay, obedient and committal principles of goal achievement. As a leader, you've got to be self-sacrificial. You've got to be obedient and committed to the principles of goal achievement if you're going to be successful in your leadership. And can, uh, let's see here, if we can go to the book of St. Luke, chapter number 14, remember the apostolics, we interpret scripture by the scripture. And when you see me going to scripture, it's because I want to make sure, amen, that it is God that has given us these things and not just coming off of the top of Robert Douglas's mind. Luke chapter number 14, all right? Verses number 28, amen, through 35. The Bible says, now here's the parable, here, here is the uh, parable uh, of, the, uh, of the tower, all right? Or the proverb of the tower. When you talk about a parable, you're really talking about a proverb at the same time or simultaneously. The Bible says right here, amen, in the parable of the tower, for which of you intending to build a tower sits not down first? and count it the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, that all that, be, that behold, it began to mock him, saying, this man or this person began to build and was not able to finish. Eh. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first? and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sent it an ambassador or an ambassador 
and desirous conditions of peace. In other words, you mean I'm willing to compromise. You got me. Uh, okay. I never enter into a fight unless I know I'm going to win it. That's just how I am. Amen. If I get a chance to walk away from it, fine. All right. But just don't follow me. Amen. Now, when it comes to that, he said right here to look and see if he can get some conditions of peace going. Yeah, Marvin Gaye even said, war is not the answer. Only love can conquer hate. Verse 33 says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. So you and I as leaders of the day, we've got to live in model, sacrificial, and obedient, committed principles for goal achievement because we're trying to achieve a goal. And we're going to sit down and we're going to assess what we need to address and to flow and to operate in and choose a collaborative trajectory or, or route, amen, or a course of action that we can go to reach our overall goal. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. A biblical strategy and a winning formula for successful leadership. Here it is. Remember, and I have problems with this with people who are very educated, talented, and gifted. They do not understand this particular concept. Uh, success is a result. It's not an activity in our goal. Success is a result. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number 11. I don't have any uh, old wise fables or anything to tell anybody. Uh, in terms of doing the narrative of explaining this, I'm, I'm, I'm strictly biblical on this here because as of today's leader, uh, we don't have a chance to make no mistake in anybody's life that we give information to, all right? Now, when it comes to looking at results, not as activities, all right, nor as goals, look what the Bible says in Hebrews, beginning at verse number 16 right through 19 but now they desire a better country this is from the hall of faith of those that walk by faith and not by sight are those that are using faith to please god in their stewardship but now they desire a better country that is a he and heavenly semi cold i mean colon wherefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared for them a city and they believe it and they know that the real goal amen is to get to that city <laughs> by faith abraham when he was tried offered up isaac and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son all right abraham in typology being a type of god our father all right isaac being amen a type of son or a type of the lord jesus christ is that context of scripture but Abraham already knew in his mind that God was able to raise his boy up should he die. Of whom he said, amen, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Well, how is Isaac going to be called if God's going to kill him? Well, Abraham knows that the goal is to please God, and he wants to be successful. So he's got to go on through it, and he's got to go, I'm not there yet. I only have one biological son that I know of. No offense, Dr. Paulette Douglas. Amen. And, and that's Robert Jr. But I'm not ready to offer him up right now. Now, if God wants to take him and do whatever, I can't do nothing about that. But in terms of not only having but one, I don't have the faith and the power that Abraham had going with God. I haven't developed and I haven't matured to that yet because Abraham was 100 years old. I'm just about to make 70 in a few here. Amen. And I want to be able to enjoy my son, enjoy my life. I want to you know, my grandchildren, so was and so on. I'm human. But what happened was Abraham accounting, verse 19, that God was able to raise him up. And even from the dead, even which also he received him in a figure. All right? God received yes, Abraham's faith in a figure as if it was already done. But God, 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 God knew that in Abraham's heart, Abraham's goal was to please God. His formula was to be successful in that what God had called him to do and God had called him to go to the ultimate extreme to show, amen, his obedience unto God. 
And that's why Abraham is the only person in the Bible you will ever see that God called him my friend. Why did God call Abraham and Abraham alone instead of Job or David my friend? It's because the Bible says in Proverbs 17 and 17, a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Next slide, please. A true leader cannot lead with their feet on the desk. And I can reference the teaching of the late great Bishop G. E. Patterson, Gilbert O. Patterson, who quoted some spiritual leaders can become so involved with administrative activities to the extent that they become counterproductive to their true assignment as a godly leader. And if you want to see what I'm talking about, how I extrapolated that, write this down quickly. Uh, if you would go to the Southern California first jurisdiction of the Holy Convocation of the Church of God in Christ, the 2004 is on uh, YouTube, the 2004 uh, a session at uh, West Angeles Church of God in Christ, the late great Honorable Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson, the presiding bishop of that time of the Kojic uh, uh, family, uh, he preached and taught a message, amen, the power of the word. And he uh, used uh, Acts 10, 44 through 48, am I right? And uh, he told how uh, Bishop, no, Bishop Charles uh, Edward Blake told how he had ran against uh, uh, Bishop Patterson, but Bishop Patterson, amen, wanted to show the type of leader he was. When he won, he did not go after Bishop Blake's head. He appointed the first administrative move that he made. He did not sit there with his feet on the desk talking about, let me go get everybody who didn't support me or ran after me and let me demote them and keep them from my administration. No, Bishop Patterson, the first action that he took, his own record in the Church of God Christ archive, amen, that he chose Bishop Charles E. Blake as his next, his first assistant, amen, presider. Now, somebody said, well, they're Trinitarian. They just said, I don't care. The truth is the truth. I don't care what religious environment it comes from, amen. The truth still is the truth, all right? And we need to take, amen, the truth to, from wherever we can get it, amen, to make sure that we're productive in our leadership assignment instead of being counterproductive. But you can't do it with your feet set back on the desk, amen, and wait, you got to learn how to delegate. I've seen so many people delegate themselves out of a job, and then the preacher, person who told them to delegate so much stuff became the leader and replaced them. Move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. You'll catch that next week. Leaders are commanded, okay, to learn and master the science of utilizing true purpose, function, and structure in carrying out and fulfilling our kingdom projects. Uh, I've had people ask me one time, what do you mean you say that all the time? Uh, what is purpose, function, and structure? What do you mean by that? So forth and so on. Purpose is what you're about. That's your edict. That's your mandate. Okay? That's your mission statement. Function is how you're going to operate. All right? And what trajectory or what course of action that you're going to take. Uh, thank you, Jesus. And then the structure is your foundation of where everything else rests upon in terms of you fulfilling what it is you call to do. Go to Nehemiah, the second chapter, quickly, please. Nehemiah, the second chapter. All right. I got some other things I want to share with you over here. And if you look at verses number 17 through 20, all right. The Bible says Nehemiah encourages, okay, the people to build the walls. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, a type of fellowship, that we be no more reproach, all right, or disdain object in the eyes of our adversaries. Verse 18, Then I told them of the hand of God, which is good upon me. Can't say it for nobody else, Nehemiah is saying, but I'm a leader. As also the king's word that he has spoken unto me, and they said, let us arise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. They strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sinbalat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem came, the Arabian, uh, Geshem the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us, and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then I answered them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build, and we will have no, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Any outsiders, amen, 
who try to come in and attack your true purpose and how God has allowed for you to function and what your purpose is structured on and the strategies on you, they are not going to succeed. That's why the Bible says, amen, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 54, verse number 17, no weapon that formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that will rise up against us in judgment, in authority given to us by God, the hand of our good God, like Nehemiah, upon our effort, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage. God said, you got this. I gave this to you. Amen. I gave this to you. Hallelujah. What he's trying to tell us is now that we are back into another paradigm shift and another paradigm mode to whereas God is utilizing, okay, the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic, amen, and the shelter down or shelter in dynamic or process we must still build the wall of fellowship using social uh, 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 media as sociological and biblically oriented, amen, tools and resources to fulfill the calling that God has on our life. Next slide, please. My time is getting away from me. Leaders must always assume the proactive attitude, all right, of whatever this project is going to be. Is left up to the personal determination within me. You can reference Genesis 39, 1 through 14 and see that. Next slide, please. Successful leaders operate their stewardship in the midst of the late, or in the mindset of the late great Dr. George Washington Carver when he admonished his students to start where you are with what you have, make something of it, and never be satisfied. And that's what we're going to do, amen, as leaders today with this paradigm shift and the pivoting uh, 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 activities we're going to have to make as Pastor uh, Subcommittee Hamilton said, in order to be successful when God calls us to do. Next, please. Effective leaders characterize and prioritize, prioritize the worst of everything first. Always put first thing first, but take the most difficult and the most challenging and put it first. And also remember, no one can truly become a successful leader void of competition amen it is going to be competitiveness there is a such thing as competition breeds success when it's done in the spirit of christ you can reference first corinthians 9 24 27 on that on your own next slide please wise leaders take things that a turtle's pace and they keep in mind it's a winner's race don't try to jump out there and be a man mr or mrs big shot and the savior of mankind god has not called us to save the world in 20 minutes, even though we may have a multiplicity and abundance of resources and personnel that are very uh, technically savvy and computer-wise and so forth and so on. Now we're gonna get all the people coming to our website doing our, don't, 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 don't do that. Amen. If you do, you'll make yourself a successful failure. The Bible said, God added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Time getting away from me here now. Uh, let's see here, go to the next slide, please because I have some very important spiritual leaders daily. They daily remind themselves that their families, amen, and uh, i got two minutes, their families and those that are following and serving under their leadership, that's the best is yet to come, Philippians 1 and 6, all right? And being confident of this very thing, Philippians 1 and 6, he which has begun that good work in you, he shall perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, please. Every wise servant leaders, okay, wise servant leaders connect and teach others as well as the methods of connecting with the clause. We that are really into Christ, we're the clause. That's Christian living against worldliness and sin, all right? God gave me that when I was in Israel in 1992. And how to remain free of the jaws. That's five time audacious wicked saints. And you know, don't let, I don't care that I well down at the pot of Anyway, if you see somebody plagiarize this, you know this came from your bishop, amen. And you know that's my personality and that's my speech style, all right? Stay away from the jaws, amen. Jive time audacious wicked saints. There are some in the body. Read. I mean, next one, please. Want to conclude. Here's my conclusion. Listen to this, all right? What we're going to do is we're going to take on the mindset of this paradigm shift and we're going to let people know that their success is our passion. We're called to be leaders and we're endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in the Central California District Council. 
And this time of history is forcing upon us an extremely difficult, amen, in, in extremely difficult proportion. The call for true and strong leadership is needed like never before. And I believe that the most effective way of dealing with this type of trouble is by biblically based transparency and true exampleship as we pursue peace in the midst of crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic, the social unrest such as racism and Black Lives Matter calls for we, the Christian leaders of society, to constantly remind ourselves that the character of our leadership, all right, it matters. The character of our leadership, it matters. And this calls, we who are called to lead for Christ are compelled to tap into his fountain of wisdom and create a winning formula and strategy, amen, so that the team that the Lord, so that the team that the Lord has assigned us to lead, amen, can be successful. Any questions, amen, you can still send them as Tracy said, and also remember that as your diocesan, I have been given, amen, the assignment and given the privilege by God to give you your new theme, should the Lord tarry and the rapture is delayed for 2021. The new theme for 2021 is stepping into alignment with our new kingdom assignment. And that's extrapolated from Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Therefore, I would like to conclude by sharing with you that the church after COVID-19 must face the hard reality. The church after COVID-19 we must realize that the impact of this crisis will not be measured in weeks or even in months, but in years. What we're looking at, all right, what we're actually looking at, okay, we cannot go back like uh, Bishop Hamilton said. We must rebuild our ministries, amen, and rather than simply restart them, we must rebuild them. The leaders, the volunteers, the participants, our systems for each ministry will need to be re-engaged re-energized, rebuilt, and in some cases replaced. And this will not happen quickly, which leads me to the second reality we must face. That is, this is projected to be a two-year process because we are woefully underestimating the length and the impact of the pandemic. And finally, the church after COVID-19 will not be measured or will not be evaluated by metrics alone. It has changed. Online engagement will skyrocket Socially distant services will require more discipleship, of which will be not be measured in groups, but in social media. It will propel us to become more focused on individual discipleship. And as the late great Bishop Richard Senior would say, relax, for God is still in control. Not thank you. I mean, I thank you. God bless you. I uh, apologize for going two minutes over. But like I say, email me. Uh, text me any question that you might have relative to the subject. I'll get the vision out to the bastards and the seven divisions of the district elders in the weeks to come. Uh, bless you and God keep you and thank you in Jesus' name.